So it is my pleasure now to introduce the panelists and the moderators for this panel discussion on emerging perspectives of funders in the backdrop of the economic crisis and the evolution of funding landscape. So our first panelist would be is Mr. Rahil Rangwala, who is the director of India programs Michael and Suan Dell Foundation, Ma Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. So Rahel is the director of the Family Economic Stability Team in India, and he oversees the foundation's investments in the financial inclusion and livelihood sectors. He has spent over seven years at Bridgewater Associates, which is a global macro hedge fund, before making the transition to the developmental sector. So it's a pleasure to have you here with us, Mr. Rahil. Our second panelist for this session is Mr. Murugan B, who is the head of, head of South Asia of the Social Innovation Group of Cisco. So Mur Murugan is the head of uh, Social Innovation Group of Cisco across the entire South Asia, and he also serves as a board of Common Purpose of India. Murugan is an exceptionally strong CSR leader who also has a strong experience as a customer focused business and technology leader. Thank you so much for uh, taking time to be a part of our panel discussion. Our third panelist for the day is Mr. John Solinikov, who is the Program Director of Education of UBS Optimist Foundation. So he is a Romanian born American, um, Romanian born American raised professional with more than 15 years of global experience in financial services, management, consulting and education. Prior to UBS, John was the founder and CEO of Teach for Romania and continues to serve as the chairman of its board. Thank you so much for joining us today, John. Our fourth panelist is Dr. Minu Bhambhani, who is the vice president on Head of Corporate Citizenship and Inclusion and Diversity, APAC at State Street. So Minu has 20 years of experience in human development with specialization in social policy and has been published extensively, has published extensively on CSR and disability inclusion. She currently heads CSR and diversity and inclusion at State Street. Our last panelist for this panel discussion is Abha Toritsha, the founding member of the British Asian Trust. Abha leads social finance work across South Asia and has contributed to its design and leadership during the startup years and now to its growth. She has over 15 years of experience working on strategic pro pro programmatic solutions, tackling complex issues throughout South Asia. Her expertise and ability to leverage key cross-sector partnerships has been a crucial driver of the development of innovative social finance mechanism, heightening the trust's entrepreneurial approach to philanthropy to meet sustainable developmental goal targets. Welcome, Abha. And our moderator for this panel discussion is Ratish Balakrishnan, who is the co-founder and managing partner at Sattva. Ratish engages closely with corporations, nonprofit organizations, social enterprises, and the larger ecosystem in designing, implementing, and scaling innovative social impact solutions on the ground. He also contributes towards advocacy and policy formulation at both state and central level on education and skill development. He is a part of the faculty for the CSR certification course conducted by the Indian Institute of Corporate Affairs. And prior to Sattva, Ratish has worked for 10 years at SAP across engineering, product management, solution management, and corporate strategy. Ratish is a graduate of Bits Pilani. Thank you so much, Ratish, for uh, joining as a moderator for this panel discussion. Uh, over to the moderator now. Thank you so much. Uh, and hello, everybody. There are 236 and counting people listening to all of us, and that's amazing. Uh, it's, it's indeed great to be part of the Charcha movement in some sense and contribute whatever we uh, know around the skill development entrepreneurship space. Uh, I want to make the best use of our time, so I want to jump right into uh, the conversation. Uh, so the current COVID impact on skill development and entrepreneurship is fairly significant. And to understand it, you can look at it from three lenses. There is the demand lens, which is really where do skilled people go? 
and we now know that the uh, industry demand for people in general given the economic recession that everyone considers Im is imminent is going to be uh, you know is, is going to be impacted and there are probably some sectors that are going to be able to hire while others are not being able to hire i think that is going to be one demand side impact of skilling uh, the second is the supply side impact of skilling i mean just the demographic of people we have to look to skill from young people out of school to graduates to people who are retrenched from their current jobs to migrants that have come back to women that are looking to work to support their families so there is a large scale uh, you know reimagination of the supply side of people who are looking to be skilled which is something that is facing us as well and lastly there is the ecosystem level impact in the sense that there is the challenge of the mobilization the training the use of technology uh, you know ways in which the way skilling is in general done in a physical or a digital model as they call it has to be reimagined given the covid reality as well and all of this is our questions where there are not straightforward answers but be great to get some of our most strategic donors in the skilling space here on the panel to get their thoughts and perspectives on how does how do they see the situation and what are their forecasts for what we will see going forward uh, thanks everybody rahil abba murugan amino and john to be part of the panel discussion uh, murugan and rahil i want to start with you for the first question which is really how do you think the skill paradigm is going to evolve you know uh, earlier skilling was a lot about training now given the focus on financial linkages social protection health and livelihood would be great to get your thoughts on how do you see the skilling paradigm evolve going forward rahil i'll probably start with you and then go to murugan thanks guys uh, thanks for the question mr pratish um so uh, you know, i don't think there are clear answers to everything nobody really knows how things will change but what i can speak to is what is already changing and what we think are uh, will be some of the things that will stick first and foremost um you know center based models have i mean this may have been sort of a death blow to center based models um uh, we've already had center based models being higher in opex it's just been a tougher thing and uh, a lot of the skilled training providers have been doing a more gradual transition to technology um this is sort of that you know that that catalyst that has really pushed everyone and i think across the board you're seeing a, a massive embrace of technology now the challenge becomes that not all skills can be done through tech so how do you um for the informal sector for things that are like plumbing that are very much on hard skills how do you combine what can be done through digital plus some physical and i think there will be an evolution where i think the center based models will all move towards either it'll be purely all tech or it'll be some sort of blended where you kind of can show up at a center once a week twice a month um but even then you may see a, a significant use of technology in those centers i think that's the biggest shift in the change that uh, will happen and i think that's that's going to continue to happen i think the um uh, other thing um that's going to sort of be recognized at least in the short term is the need for um a lot of some aspects of health kind of training in various different job roles like i i can imagine sort of this notion of sanitizing whatever you are doing whether you're a car mechanic whether you're in the hospitality industry uh, anything where you are dealing with customers where you have to then um where you are giving a product or touching a product element of sanitization will always be be critical at least for the next 6 maybe 9 months um but it's perhaps a good change in any case from a hygiene and sanitization perspective i'll say those two changes are perhaps the biggest um I, i don't think there are you know um this switch towards focusing on jobs i think all all of those have been happening over the last two years in any case i think now there's a much more i think the crisis has created a, a a focus on that question a lot more because the need for getting people in the life years and how desperate it is for people to be able to earn is um, is is quite clear so i think that that has heightened the conversation but i don't think that's a necessarily because of covid alone i think that's just a uh, something that is sped it up um and lastly you know i 
what I hope will be a, a, a much faster shift or a bigger embrace of earn and learn models where you will have people who don't, we just don't have the luxury of letting them not earn. Um, how will that sort of get sped up and how will, how will the demand side embrace that? I think those changes um, we have to sort of wait and watch on. Thanks, Rahn. Extremely sharp and I have a couple of follow-up questions but we can uh, come to that at a later point in time. Morgan, it would be great for you to add on top of what uh, you know, Rahil has already shared from your vantage point of having funded skilling programs as well. Yeah, I had actually three points and Rahil covered all three. Right? Uh, <laughs> I was talking about the center. You know, if you took a, like an average center, a few hundred square feet big and, you know, 50 chairs, you know, even the physical distancing norms alone are going to make it very difficult for the entrepreneur to continue to run that business. Forget the whole other digital piece. Then there's a the digital. So I won't cover those two that Riles covered, but I had one other point. Maybe I'll come from a funder point of view. I actually had the earn and learn as well, but you took that. Uh, I, I took the, uh, uh, from a, when we normally look at investments in the skilling side, we always used to look at skilling as an area where there was a return on investment, right? Where there is a possibility of fee models, revenue models, or, you know, uh, someone getting a job and then paying that back. With the economy the way it is, I think funders are going to have to have a little bit more patience in terms of expecting a return. Uh, I think we're going to have to move towards a little bit more of a philanthropic mindset because uh, the ROI is going to take a while because people are not going to get jobs immediately, perhaps. Right? I hope that's not the case. But I think from a funder point of view, in my own mind, when we uh, are going to look at funding this year, Normally we say, okay, what's your revenue model? How much subsidies? What's your student per student cost? Has it been going down every year? I think this year we're going to have to say, okay, you know, we're going to have to add a little bit of philanthropic element to it. Uh, a good example is even what happened for our existing uh, portfolio organization. They came back to us and said, we'd like to repurpose some of the money into scholarships because most of our students, you know, their parents are rickshaw drivers and vegetable cart pullers and so on. Normally they pay us 500 rupees, but they're not able to do that either. We'd like to turn that around and help the family. And then so that, you know, they can then in turn help the kids get educated and skilled. So I think that's the only addition I would make to what Rahil already, um, you know, laid out in terms of the physical model and digital being digital is going to be a, playing a big part in enabling a new skilling paradigm you know, in many different forms. So I think that's, I'll leave it at that. Absolutely. Thanks, Murugan. I fully, fully agree with you as well. I think uh, one of the things across the board, not just in skilling, that nonprofits have to amp up is their ability or organizations in general have to amp up is their ability to be uh, a lot more robust and agile with technology today going forward. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, I want to bring in Abba and John uh, next. Uh, Abba, one of the things that, I mean, just building on what Murugan is saying as well, is just the types of capital that's going to come into skilling is going to be mo a lot more different now. You know, we need the patient capital, we need the industry to come in, governments talking about bringing in money as well. Um, and we've always had a conversation around, around development impact bonds, you know, around, uh, uh, you know, skilling. Is this the right time for development impact bonds to come in? How do you see that? It would be great to hear both Abba and John's perspective. Abba, if you could go first. Great. Thank you, Ratish, and thank you all of you for having me on the panel. Um, so let me let me take that on that question slightly differently. The answer to capital is always yes. The question is the tool, um, and the tool is of and what does this particular tool bring alongside capital to the conversation? Um, as you talk about pivoting models, uh, I think my focus being on outcomes is which model gives you the outcome. Uh, do you still enable outcomes as you pivot models? And what development impact bonds allow you to do is focus on outcomes, whatever the model might be. So what the flexibility of the finance offers is, the, is enabling those service providers to do what they need to do with their work and funders can pay on the basis of outcome. What we might have to change is the rigor of the outcomes that we might have previously expected as your ROI keeps improving um, in terms of financial outcomes. We would also be looking at sort of higher order things, increased income, and we might have to reduce those slightly, but outcomes can be the focus and you can develop. The second is, apart from flexibility, I think it's collaborative finance. We don't think development impact bonds work suboptimal scale. So we would always do this at scale and do it large scale so that we can enable a lot of people to work collectively together on outcomes. So if you combine flexibility, you combine the time where flexibility is required 
and combine the need for philanthropic capital to work alongside impact investors, we can bring that together. So yes, now is the time is right as far as we're concerned. Um, I think what the sector will have to help us with is those models and those providers who are able to are able to jump on here, show that kind of adaptive attitude to that kind of finance. And finance should always be flexible to work with with providers. And of course, Ratish, you are talking about the gig economy as well, and we'd love to know what models come from that as well uh, for that can be put into this. But given that will be, I think, a space that will grow in the months to come. So uh, that's my two bit, and I can always give you a lot more detail on what we're actually doing. On this. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. And I, I mean, I think if if uh, DIBs can be a way for spurring innovation right now in the uh, scaling space because that's really what we need so there's a way to have, make that happen it's great and i, I want to come back on the gig economy point that you made because it is an important area for us to innovate on as well and we've been doing some work there would love to talk about it uh, john i'd love to get your perspective uh, ubs having played a, a fairly active role in the dibs uh, over the last few uh, years actually globally yeah great thank you uh, thank you for the opportunity um I think I would agree with, with Abba. I think uh, the answer is always yes in a way, but uh, that was in the details. Uh, I, I think the, we would start with the arguments of the government or to the funder, really what we're seeing uh, now in the funding landscape is every philanthropic funder and really government budgets uh, are shifting towards a near-term need, which is mostly around health uh, and sanitation type interventions. Uh, so budgets in a way, there's a massive shift and most of our partners working in the skilling and education space actually struggling to get funding because uh, funders that are open and even government budgets are shifting towards the immediate needs. Uh, but what the DIB offers is actually the funding to be uh, deferred, right? So the outcome funder is on the hook to pay at the end of the, uh, the DIB in the structure. So funding that is tied up now towards the health intervention, uh, we can go to a, a payer and say, you don't need to pay now. Uh, you, you pay for the outcome when it occurs over time. So in a way, you could, you could argue the DIB is more appropriate now for that type of situation than it would have been before because the case to defer the outcome payment is, is higher. Uh, on, the, on the topic mentioned earlier between ROI um, and, and kind of the current situation, I, we kind of think of it maybe it's a false choice, right? Because it really depends on your um, time horizon and, and what you're looking at. So the DIBs in a way, all the ones we've worked on are medium to long-term instruments and they can even be uh, elongated beyond that. And I would argue, although there's still the, the jury's out, that the, the COVID-19 crisis uh, is and will be a temporary shock. Of course, when we come out of it, uh, the world will look different, but uh, labor, labor markets will adjust uh, and employers and employees will continue to identify themselves. There will still be a skill gap. The skills demanded will be different, uh, but the parameters of the problem really won't change. Uh, and so if you believe that this is kind of a uh, a short-term problem, uh, if you're setting up a long-term DIB, we think it's still appropriate. I'll give you an example from, from one project we're doing in South Africa uh, with an organization called Harambi. This is a development impact bond in the skilling space. Uh, and here, John, the, just in the interest of time, John, if I could just ask you to hold yeah. on to that for a second. Yeah, sure. We could come back to that example at a later point. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you so much for your understanding. Uh, Mino, I want to bring you up next. Uh, thanks so much for joining. Uh, Chitra here on the chat has been talking about inclusivity, you know, I mean, especially when there's a crisis, you know, there is that 80-20 thinking that starts to emerge saying, oh, let's try and look at the mainstream a lot more, but inclusion, uh, and here I include uh, socially excluded people, people with disability, and so on, start to become less important in the larger scheme of things. Um, I wanted to, you've been a champion for inclusion in the skilling space and in general overall for the last many years. I wanted to get your thoughts on how do you see this? Uh, panning out going forward and what's your own forecast uh, towards this issue? Uh, thanks, Atish, and uh, thanks for this opportunity. Good to meet everyone after such a long time. Um, so in the last two months, what we have seen um, uh, panning out, especially in the disability space, um, on one hand, you know, uh, work from home, flexibility was something that people with disabilities always asked for, but it was either never given or was given by very few organizations. Um, it was a part of reasonable accommodation, uh, given only to some people, but uh, COVID changed that. And today work from home and flexibility became a norm for everyone. Uh, and which is what people with disabilities have been like, 
you know, rallying around and saying that, oh, look, this is something that we asked for and you used to think that you are doing a favor by giving us work from home or flexibility. And today, whole world needs it because this pandemic has impacted the whole world and 90% of uh, employed workforce is working from home. Uh, and they need that flexibility because they have children at home, they have other uh, uh, responsibilities at home, so juggling all that. However, one key aspect that has also come about is that even for those people who have been working already, how non-inclusive technology has been in facilitating their work from home. We say that, uh, you know, we will skill people with disabilities and Today, uh, with more technology, uh, more and more people will be able to find work. But in the absence of education, especially when, when you're talking of technology, when you're talking of deliverables, your key communication skills, spoken as well as written, become so critical in being able to reach out. And how are we going to build those skills in people? Technology, uh, you know, I, I see Google Meet. And I see closed captioning, you click on that and whatever I'm saying is uh, coming in the forms of captions uh, and people with disabilities are able to read it. When it comes to uh, virtual learning, virtual training, how will this ecosystem look at including those people? So there are two things. On one hand, the demand will be to make technology accessible, inclusive, uh, so that people with disabilities do not remain at the margin. But with the speed at which it will move, I think it's also going to exclude a lot of these people and push them further to the margin. So I think that is a big worry uh, in this space. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Meenu. I think you're making a very, very important point. And I want to reiterate that because we've, uh, we are also getting questions saying, are some of the models amenable to technology? But I think the larger questions are some of the people that we are skilling amenable to and ready for technology. And in some sense, what is the impact on the education system hence to even get them to a point where they can be ready for technology? I think is a, is a very, very important point, you know. Uh, so thanks for bringing it up. You know. um, I just want to go to the next question. Uh, Rahul, this, is, this one's for you. Uh, we've been talking so far as funders about how do we ensure readiness? I mean, funding on the supply side, largely. How do you fund for getting people... Uh, you know, trained and so on. But is there a role for philanthropy in catalyzing demand uh, in some sense? Where do you see investments that actually can create jobs? And is that something that donors should focus on as well? 100% yes. Um, uh, without even, you know, it's not just from a COVID perspective, but I think if we look at this, the, the problem in India today, or not even today, the last few years if lo or longer, it's not just a skilling problem, it's an employment problem. Skilling is definitely one of the many solutions to address employment. But if you don't have the right jobs, you don't have, you know, aspirational jobs that give meaningful livelihoods, you know, I don't think skilling in and of itself is going to uh, solve that. Um, and there are lots of things that uh, funders should or could do on the demand side. For example, some of our financial inclusion work you know, we've seen to the MSME sector for every two loans that are given, one, one job is created. Right? And, and a lot of these jobs sometimes are, you know, much more women-centric. A lot of new jobs for women, first-time uh, uh, jobs as well. So, I mean, I think that's just one example. There are many things in terms of facilitating more opportunity uh, when it comes to uh, catalyzing demand. I mean, um, the other day I was reading that, you know, today, top coder in, this, in the COVID crisis, 5X, they've seen a surge of 5X in terms of uh, freelance workers signing up for the platform. I mean, I think that's massive. I think that's, it's a huge opportunity uh, sort of democratizing access to enterprises that are on this platform. You don't necessarily need to have like a, a degree from a tier one college. I mean, if you have the skills, but getting the access, I think has been gated through a recruitment process that uh, said you need a degree and we all know some for certain for a lot of jobs it's not the degree it's the skills you have right um, and it's great to see a lot of platforms like top Coder, you see the nonprofits like Navgurukul that are leveraging these things um, where you can earn and learn and 
and get some of these really high-end skills. So when it comes to thinking about the demand side, I think there's a lot. I think there's more than you know, a lot of funders have sort of come across the table. I think it does require collaboration. I don't think you can think of the demand side without thinking of the supply side and vice versa. You have to think of the supply side as well. Um, and the opportunity again over here is that there will be funders who are much more focused on the supply side. Are we having those conversations with the demand side funders and seeing where we meet in the middle? Um, I think government can play a big role in this. There are bodies like NSDC that can coordinate some of this work. I can give you many more examples, but uh, I'll just pause there uh, in the interest of time. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Right? Like, the two things that you said, one, I think funding MSMEs and making sure that they sustain themselves for them to create jobs, I think is a very, very important point. And it's inextricably linked right now and we see it a lot more. And the second is hiring and talent search has always been optimized for the recruiter rather than for the person with the talent. And I think that's finally changing thanks to platforms like these that are able to uh, you know, demonstrate merit. So thanks so much for sharing that. I want to jump to Murugan. Uh, uh, Murugan, I think one of the things that, uh, I mean, there's generally been a bias in this uh, skilling sector towards the 8% organized sector, you know, like an inordinate amount of focus on a very small part of our uh, uh, working population. Uh, given the post-COVID world, again, we're talking about trends that have been in the process but are getting catalyzed. Uh, do you see a larger focus on informal workers and gig workers? It's not that it wasn't there before, but do you think there's a swing towards focusing a lot more on those workers uh, going forward? Yeah, I think you, you, you said it right. It is, it, that's a trend that has already crossed the Rubicon, right? I mean, it's not going back. Uh, it's, you know, if anything, I mean, I would look at it this way. Um, because this is a global problem um, that almost every country is now facing probably the first time everyone's facing similar challenges around the world. And if you look at, let's say, what NSDC, since you know, Rahil brought it up, NSDC and the sector skill councils uh, have, you know, their goal or their vision was always to make India as the talent hub uh, for the world, for all sectors and not just IT. Perhaps this is a fresh opportunity for, um, you know, other sectors as well, where India can be that gig working talent hub for the world, because everyone's going to have to have a clean state slate start on, okay, what am I going to do to hire people? My, you know, with a new business model, maybe the low OPEX, virtual is a new norm. People can work remotely. I think this provides some wonderful new opportunities specifically for India in terms of accelerating that move uh, towards gig, gig workers and kind of the, uh, not call them, you know, uh, informal anymore. Uh, because, you know, they should be part of the formal uh, economy. They are formal, you know, they, they pay taxes, they do everything else that a formal uh, employee or employer does. So I think, you know, it's a trend that is, uh, there's an opportunity for India to really kind of take this moment and accelerate the whole move to gig uh, with India being the talent hub, which has always been the dream of the, you know, sector skill councils of the world. Thanks, we're going to fully, fully agree with you. And this is a massive opportunity even for even priorities to be rethought out in management. You know? Who seeks such behavior? I think there's probably a lot more shift towards gig boy being and the new norm as well. So thanks so much. I want to shift to John and uh, Minu. Um, uh, John, I think again, I, another, another perception is looking at skilling from the lens of grant funding. You know, uh, it's a, seen as a pure play philanthropic funding, uh, but the problems that we are solving have always been market-based problems. You know, so I wanted to get your thoughts on how do you see um, equity and debt funding being relevant, uh, you know, in this context, uh, especially going forward. And do you see a lot more action there? And I'd love, uh, John, for you to start and then Mino can jump in as well. Sure. I mean, I, I think the one place where I've seen some development and we've been looking at is the income share agreement, which is in a way a combination of debt and equity. It's kind of the ability to take equity in the future of a uh, of, uh, of, uh, training participant. Uh, I think it's challenging. We haven't seen them take up as much because uh, it's a bit difficult to articulate and communicate the, the product to students. So while the funding is there, often the students are a bit concerned and don't understand the implications, et cetera. So I think one of the barriers is to be able to design a product that kind of solves the funding problem, but is simple enough to communicate and can be taken up. Uh, I think there's always going to be interest in these kind of funding instruments. 
Um, and, and it really depends, at the end of the day, you know, the employer is the one that will get a benefit and should be on the hook to pay something. And so you can think of a student loan as a dib where the outcome payer is the employer. Uh, and I think the student lending piece definitely has potential, again, provided the products can be well designed and easily communicated to participants. Excellent. Thank you, John. Uh, Minu, over to you. Minu, you're on mute, so we can't hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so thanks for sending this question in advance. And uh, yesterday uh, I was on call with my colleagues in EMEA and uh, North America. And uh, uh, as funders, we have been uh, deciding where to give and where to invest in the last so many years. And how is COVID changing those things? So it was interesting for me to have the discussion with them. And uh, from a global perspective, uh, you know, it, our view is that we will enter a period of caution for quite a few years as countries will rebuild their economies. Uh, there are fears that countries focus inwards. The global market will dislocate into more regional alliances with parts of the world that successfully managed COVID in Southeast Asia and Pacific being isolated from those that were less successful. So if you're thinking that a lot of uh, global work will come to India now, uh, it will be outsourced. I think that will take a take a beating. That will take a hit. So I think, but new opportunities will emerge. Countries, I think, have also realized that global supply chains are fragile, and critical supplies can be easily interrupted. So health and other sectors, uh, medical supplies, for example, there will be more investment in those. Uh, but I don't think funders are macro economists. They would leave uh, development uh, and uh, of economies to, to, to governments and corporations. But uh, the dollar, I think, initially will move to rebuilding and reestablishing internal markets. It will naturally encourage some innovation. But in general, I think uh, citizens will want to have what they have what they once had and what they once trusted. So it will how long it will take after this epidemic, uh, it is impossible to estimate right now. Um, but I think we maybe we are still at the beginning and not at the end. Yeah, I agree. I think, and again, this is for me a very Hamlet type question that I've been uh, discussing with a lot of the donors I've been in touch with today to, to do or not to do right now. Uh, because there is an immediate need. How do you respond? Yeah. Respond to that and hope. But thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I want to come uh, take a few questions from the audience as well. Uh, Rizwan has a question uh, where he's making it an either or. He's saying, you know, rather than looking at fresh skilling, uh, you know, should we look at uh, focusing on cross trade? I mean, focusing on reskilling the people that have been laid off. You know, there is, like we said, the supply side is changing because there is an, uh, you know, a retrenched workforce. If given a choice to the funders, where would you put your money on? And if let's assume the money is limited. Would it be to fresh uh, skill, you know, skill fresh people or would it be to uh, skill the ones that have been laid off right now in the workforce and have to go back? Anyone in the audience, I mean, uh, among the panel who want to take that question and answer? Uh, you got to give it to someone, Ritesh. <laughs> We're all on mute. Uh, no, I, 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 I don't. I don't think there's an either or. The way they think. it's not a not an either or situation. Um, it's really a question of how well structured the proposal is. You know, where do we see the most, um, you know, create you know innovation going on in terms of the proposal? What's the impact? You know, it's a standard metrics that we normally look at when we evaluate any proposal. We we'll probably revert back to that. We may or may not have a bias around, okay, this one is, you know, someone who has a family versus that one can still have a few more years to figure out. That's a, it, it, then you get into a slippery slope where you can't put those uh, measurements. So we'll stick to the, the grant execution model that we have and evaluate it on the merits of the proposal. I think that's the right thing to do in my opinion. You're on mute, Ratish. Thank you. 
I was saying that it's uh, not just a target segment based prioritization, but really the effectiveness of the solution that's coming through, you know, yeah. a poor solution for target segment two cannot win over an effective solution on target segment one. I agree. Yeah. Me, no, I don't know if you want to add anything to that before I move to the next question. Yeah. So, you know, one is um, with, if we see the current in the, in the medium term uh, with schools and colleges being shut, for example, uh, a person not having an opportunity to win skill himself or herself, I think the focus of a lot of funders may move towards improving uh, and managing household incomes and continuing to support uh, and motivate individuals to uh, remain connected to the skilling ecosystem so that they are able to, to you know, a vibrant community with a well-skilled population seems to be the most attractive way to uh, catalyze uh, change in this space. Got it. Got it. Uh, I want to move to the next question. I think this is from Murugan and uh, I'd love to also have uh, Rahil chime in because you talked about it as well. Uh, you talked about um, job-oriented tech programs being a lot more technology-based, but do you see that being relevant to the large group of uh, skill programs that we have given a lot of our skill programs a high touch hands-on etc that you touched upon this uh, you know for the informal segment and i don't know i'm probably you know just also asking uh, murugan from your perspective uh, you know being in cisco do you also see a greater uptake for innovations like ar and vr being more people being more open to that for some of these high touch roles you know and i know g has been trying that in the healthcare space for a while so we'd love to see question number one Will technology be relevant to the large share of uh, skilling programs that we are running? Question number, sub question there is, uh, will there be a greater adoption of technology that we might think is a little more ahead of time, given, uh, you know, current circumstances, but maybe more relevant to the COVID uh, context? Rahil, you go first. Okay, fine. Um, so, the, there is going to be, obviously, and we're seeing a lot of adoption of tech. Um, now, uh, the, I mean, when you talk about job-oriented tech programs being high-touch and hands-on, I, I don't understand whether that high-touch necessarily means physical. We, there are lots of high-touch that can be um, completely virtual and digital, right? So one of our, you know, one of our portfolio companies, um, which is Nguru, has launched a live class product, which has done really incredibly well. And the feedback, the retention, the participation of students um, has been fantastic. It's been phenomenal. I mean, I think if you control for the, the quality of trainers on the platform, are they well trained? Is the technology good? Is the UI good? If you control for those factors, you can replicate a lot of high touch quality online as well. So, um, I mean, I guess I was not sure specifically about the question when he talks about high touch, is he necessarily or she necessarily mean um, it's going to be physical because I think you can, and a lot of people are moving towards that. The other thing that we're seeing in high touch is the introduction of bots, uh, WhatsApp based chatbots. Um, these are, these definitely replace some amount of, uh, complement the self learning component that comes with online digital models where if someone gets stuck and they don't have somebody to ask a question to, it's ridiculous to kind of expect them to continue doing more of the same question if they've not got the concept. So in, to be able to you know, chat with some kind of AI-based chatbot, which is, I don't think that's a future a technology of the future, it's a technology of the now, right? I think it only gets easier and better and maybe more um, voice recognition with, with vernacular can perhaps be better or something like that. But um, you can start seeing a lot of components of blended high touch models. Um, and, and potentially in the post COVID scenario, you can think about high touch where you are meeting people physically at a much lower frequency. So you could, uh, you, may, you may not need to have a lot of space. You can, uh, you can ration that space out over longer periods of time, get a higher capacity utilization as a result. There, there are interesting models that could evolve where you can blend some of these things as well. Um, so I don't necessarily think of this as just either or. You can start delivering things virtually, but I think you can start replicating high touch virtually as well. And we've seen that in our portfolio. We've seen it work really well. 
and you know, we have a very small portfolio. I don't think I can speak for the rest of the industry, but if we, we've seen it, I'm sure there are many, many more examples of that. Thanks, Ryan. I'm going to skip you on this one, Morgan. I'm so sorry. Just an no worries. I don't have much to add. Uh, yeah. yeah. I think there's a good question there in the, uh, in the panel. I want to make that my penultimate question, then we'll close with the last question, which is what do you think we will not do? Funders will not do in the, in, in the post-COVID world. Are, are there things that you're doing today that you think you will do less of uh, going forward? You know, uh, and I think that's a great question to ask. Uh, and uh, I'll just probably give a few seconds, but anybody can go. If, if you're not picking it up, I'm going to call my name. Someday. Yeah, I, I can jump in and just quick, give a quick answer. I, yes. I think there's a lot of discussion now in the funding community about restricting, ver restricted versus unrestricted funding. I think the crisis made a lot of foundations kind of rethink the, the degree to which they want to uh, restrict financing. And in a world where there's a high degree of uncertainty, uh, trying to tie your funding to specific activities uh, probably makes less sense. So I imagine there's going to be more of an evolution towards funding that's flexible and adaptable, and hopefully, and as we think, give more ownership at the end to the, to the end recipients. Uh, the development impact bonds that we talked about earlier are an example of that, where really the, the agency goes fully to the grantee and, and they can undertake whatever activities they wish. So that's what I think and maybe hope. Yeah, that's a great answer, John. Thank you so much. Uh, any other thoughts? I think a uh, lot of uh, funders now, especially those who are funding uh, education and skilling, uh, especially hands-on, uh, will focus more on tech and be very careful about uh, the impact that your brick and mortar model will have on deliverables and on the beneficiary. So I think post-COVID, that is a big impact that will see a hit. Got it. Makes sense. Uh, great. Uh, we have four minutes on the clock, so I want to close this on time. Uh, one question to all the uh, panelists. Uh, it's a 20 lakh crore um, announcement that's been recently made by the government. More details are coming out. The finance minister released a, uh, you know, a document today as well. If there's one thing that you, you would ask the government to invest in, in the light of the current crisis, what could that be? And if you can keep your answer really, really sharp, one sentence on what you would uh, invest in, I think that'll be great. I'm going to start with Murugan and then uh, go to the other. Okay. Well, I uh, honestly, I don't know. I, I don't know if we can advise the government on anything, but I would tell you what we should be looking at doing is doing more collaboration, right? And it's an answer to the previous question as well. This is not the time for uh, organizations, com companies, funders to, uh, you know, build a brand or PR. You know, if you have assets, put it out there for free, uh, let people access it. Um, I think that's what, that would be the, the thing that I would, you know, conclude it with is like, you know, whatever the government's focus is, they've already announced five pillars of focus. There is tech, there is infrastructure, there is, you know, demographic people development and so on. But I think, you know, regardless of that, uh, one thing that we have in our control is that, you know, we can collaborate uh, and foster more collaboration within the, uh, the grantee ecosystem as well. So that's something that I would definitely push for this year. Great. Thanks, Murugan. Rahil? Um, my humble request would be if you're going to if you are going to push this money out into the system and if we focus on skilling then um, as you are giving this money to industry really push the apprenticeships like make that the make that something you can link to apprenticeships and and can spur that because i think the earn and learn models are a way out where you can actually get training done as well as jobs brilliant uh you know I will leave it to economists. I'm not an economist. I don't want to talk about this. Got it. Uh, John, do you have any advice for our government? Yeah, I mean, I would just, you know, rather than say what to invest in, I would kind of ask the question how, and the how for me would be trying to crowd in and bring in private capital. Uh, skilling is inherently, as we discussed earlier, an economic activity. Uh, and if they just do it without any private capital, I think there's going to be limits to what they can achieve. Great. Uh, that brings us to an end. We have two minutes uh, to the uh, ring of the bell. Thank you so much, everybody. For me, a couple of takeaways. One, technology and the role of technology in skilling is going to be extremely critical. I think that's one very important uh, aspect that I think all of us in some sense highlighted. Uh, the second is in terms of uh, being outcome focused and spurring innovation as donors is going to be critical, but at the same time being a little more patient with 
outcomes in some sense and what we can expect i think is going to be important and um, the third is uh, yes technology is critical but the readiness of the population to technology is something that we got to watch out for it's extreme. we might inadvertently exclude the population we want to impact by keeping a stronger eye on technology and i think that's something that uh, we want to watch out for as well uh, earn while you learn models apprenticeships i think are going to be critical i think it came up in the questions from the audience as well finding ways to force companies or msmes even to adopt practices around earn while you learn even treating work as well while giving that money i think is going to be an extremely important aspect uh, and it's not who we target it's really the effectiveness of the solution so it's really the time to come up with very effective solutions for us to engage funders on this as well so those are great takeaways for me i hope everybody on the panel enjoyed it as well thanks so much all of you i think it's been a great and engaging conversation